Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Innovation Showcase. The main purpose of this ongoing series is to inform viewers about creative individuals and outstanding innovations across the fields of business, science, technology, education, and the arts. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Ruth Ganesh. Ruth is an extremely dedicated conservationist and philanthropist with a particular interest in environmental issues. She's a member of the Coexistence Collective, a trustee of Elephant Family USA, and co-founder of the environmental arts body, Platform Earth. Ruth's here today to inform us both about those groups and an incredible initiative they're involved with called the Great Elephant Migration which is a global fundraising effort driven by the collaboration between indigenous artisans, contemporary artists, and cultural institutions. More specifically, in an effort to promote the coexistence of humans and animals in Asia, more than 100 life-size elephants have been created and are currently on display at several locations in Newport, Rhode Island. To better understand and appreciate this noteworthy undertaking, let's start by meeting Ruth and then finding out all about the great elephant migration. Welcome, Ruth. So delighted you're able to be here. So happy to be here, Jay. Thank you for having me on. And, you know, first of all, just congratulations and thank you to you and all your colleagues for all your conservation efforts and for bringing the great elephant migration to Newport. Eager to hear much more about it and have you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, I think it would also be of interest if you'd briefly share just a little bit about your background, professional interests, perhaps. Of course. Um, well, I guess I've been around for in the elephant space for about 20 years most of my adult life mm -hmm. and uh that has you know i think elephants are perhaps one of the most creative looking animals um on the planet and I, it led me down the route of creativity and working with artists to evoke the elephant in different kinds of exhibitions so from there i've um i've ended up becoming very involved in both conservation and the arts and i fused the two together to, um, to become, I think I call myself a creative conservationist. And I, I sort of realized that my contribution is, is very much in that space. Right, and very committed to the public art aspect of it. And nothing could be a prime example than the great uh, elephant migration that you've helped orchestrate. Would you please share a little more background, maybe information for those not familiar with the elephant family organization and then um, Coexistence Collective and how they've collaborated on this project, please. Yes, absolutely. So Elephant Family is um, a, a not-for-profit charity that was set up about 22 years ago to conserve the Asian elephant, which has typically been sort of poor relation of the African elephant, despite being much more endangered. So it was set up by an incredible human being called Mark Shand, mm. uh, who was a bit of an Indiana Jones kind of a figure and realized, hang on, there's a whole species that the world has not switched onto. So he set Elef Elephant Family up to focus on that. And the mission started with, you know, elephants in captivity and grew to wild elephants and then we take a landscape level approach now um, and very community orientated and because of our desire to have communities very much lead the solutions to some of the problems we came across the coexistence collective and uh, which actually was not even named that at the time it was really just a very small group of indigenous um, artisans and conservationists in tamil nadu in southern india who live in somewhere called the Nilgiri Hills, where people and elephants overlap in the densest concentrations anywhere in the planet. And uh, by working with them and understanding their deep, deep connection with the elephants that they coexist with, we decided to start making a herd and it, it grew from there. So the Coexistence Collective is, yeah, it's a very special indigenous group of about four different uh, tribal communities. Could you 
continue, because this is an incredibly fascinating part, how these life-size elephants, which we'll see shortly and at their location in Newport, how they're made, who makes them. It's an incredible process at several wonderful levels. Oh, thank you. Yes, it takes, I mean, the whole herd has taken about five years to create. Each elephant is first studied by the conservationists, and I work with someone called Dr. Tash Di Akiara, um, who is a very special human being and has studied all of these elephants in the wild, and he's photographed them, and the communities know them by name. He's helped them identify the different personalities of individual elephants, which helps everyone know which ones you know, how to behave according, as we do with human beings, we know which human beings are grumpy, we know which human beings are very timid, and, and others that are maybe a little bit more troublesome. So uh, his, it started with his work, and then, uh, yes, her, his wife Shubra is a designer, and she draws the forms out, and then they get turned into metal, sort of skeletal level metal frames, and then they're clad in um, a very troublesome invasive weed called Lantana camera, which is a South American plant that uh, was introduced by British tea planters to India back in the day as a decorative plant to go around their bungalows, but unfortunately has um, completely taken over a lot of India's protected areas. So they were trying, we were trying to find an economic model to remove it when it's you know, at such a scale and um, start off with furniture and then realize that elephants were much better. So that's, uh, that's how they're made. And again, it's this collaboration is uh, everybody, it sort of builds on this. It takes a village between local people, uh, contemporary artists, as we said at the introduction, and then the next stage, uh, collaborating institutions, um, really gives ownership, especially for the local individuals to be a part of this uh, groundbreaking effort in many ways. That's right. I mean, I, you're so right. When you really made me smile when you said it takes a village, because if you could see how the elephants are made during the pandemic, everyone had to start making them at home in their village. We couldn't join together anymore. So we have about 20 different villages, each with a workshop in the middle, and you have everyone involved in making those elephants. But yes, certainly in Newport, it has felt like such a wonderful community effort. And we are so, so honored um, and touched by the support that we have been given by Art in Newport and Dodi Kazanjan, living legend that she is, and Edith McBean, who is another great matriarch of this whole uh, endeavor. And, um, you know, they really opened up Newport in a lifetime of contacts and friendships and, and you know, created partnerships with you know, museum worthy contemporary artists like Hadi Falapishi, um, who you may have seen at the Breakers and um, the Great Friends Meeting House on Rough Point. He has exhibitions in all of those institutions. I think the Breakers is coming last, actually, I'm not sure that that's quite ready yet. But um, yes, it's a wonderful medley of, of, of different angles and people, very much a village, as you say. Now, before we see the uh, elephants at Newport, where were they originally? And then we'll talk about how they made their way over here. So their first ever public displays, I guess, were, I, it was London. It was actually during the pandemic, they were on the water and they had to come to my farm in the Cotswolds, which then meant they started spreading throughout the Cotswolds because my farm couldn't possibly fit in all of the herd. And we were very lucky that our, pa our president, our royal president, Her Majesty the Queen, had them adopted by various friends during the lockdown. So they started off that way and then they migrated to London and they were in the royal parks. And then we decided to go for an even bigger idea to migrate them from the east to west coast of America and starting in Newport. Wonderful, wonderful. And then picking up on that, how did they make their way? What was the collaboration? You mentioned Art and Newport and Dodie. Um, how did that arrangement come about? Uh, I think it was really due to friendships. I, you know, Art in Newport also has um, Edith McBean on their board and she is kind of similar-ish to me in that she spans her two big passions, art and conservation. Uh, she's on another another level of effectiveness. Um, so Edith was a dear friend just in the space and she knew what I'd been working on and said, you must bring it to Newport. 
and let's see if Dodi would be interested and happily she was. So that's really how it all came about. It's always, it's always at the root of anything like this. I always feel it's love, love and friendships. And um, that was the genesis. And it goes so well with the Newport restoration efforts as well, I think. Um, so it's sort of a match that was definitely made and destined to be. Yes, we're all in the business of conservation, uh, conservation of icons, I guess. And um, of course, now all of these buildings are facing some of the effects of climate change and they're looking to uh, you know, be energy efficient. So we touch on a lot of issues uh, in common. So we, I mean, can you believe that to start off with houses like the Breakers, we're thrilled. Incredible. Well, let's uh, take a little tour. And first of all, what a gorgeous setting. What are we looking at now before we get some really close shots of the elephants that we can see there down below? I think we're looking at about half of the herd at Rough Point, um, Doris Duke's uh, original home. Uh, on the morning that we went live, that was the first sunrise as the herd were unveiled on American soil. And we really just wanted to evoke the image of the elephants landing, um, almost as if they swum from India uh, onto, onto American soil. And, we, and yes, there they are there, just heading out to sea. Um, we were thrilled with how they appeared, you know, just so beautiful and natural um, with the matriarchs at the front and the tuskers at the back for protection and little babies speckled amongst them. Now, I know the opening was a grand event. Can you share a little bit about what was involved there and just some of the individuals, uh, groups that were represented? Oh, yes. Yes, it was very special. We, we did this blessing, actually. Um, so we had uh, Sister Therese and Hugh Hitsley, um, who represented the Christian tradition, the Christian faith, and they did a, a beautiful blessing from the Bible. And then we had um, a Hindu priest as well, also from Rhode Island, who came and did. And uh, the Ganesh is the elephant headed God in the, in, in the Hindu tradition and um, you know, is seen as the remover of obstacles. And we had all of the different institutions from Salve Regina University to Rough Point, the Restoration Society, the Breakers, and a lot of friends that are behind this endeavor all came in their beautiful summer clothes and we threw uh, flower petals all over the elephants and fed them little tangerines and fruit and just, uh, you know, wish them well. Um, I'm actually holding the, the scents, funnily enough, I don't know why I'm holding them. I was given three cents by the Hindu priest to help us raise lots of money for all the conservation projects that the elephants are raising money for. Each elephant's twinned with a different um, conservation project in different parts of the world, including in the States. And it's Save the Bay here in Newport that we're supporting. Um, so yes, hopefully we will sell lots of elephants and we have already. So that's the good news. <laughs> no, I think you've sell uh, quite a few to help raise funds for the uh, conservation efforts. Is that right? I think already. Uh, yes, I, I was so, you know, we were all so nervous. We, we, you know, we have, you know, we're from England and India. We don't know so many people in America, but we have been absolutely astonished by the generosity that has been shown and um, you know it took us a long time to sell a couple of hundred elephants in the UK it took us a couple of years and in the first three weeks we are almost at a hundred elephants that have found homes so wow we're really you're talking to a very happy elephant lover right now <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible well they're inc they're captivating not to mention the incredible cause that they help support. So let's appreciate their beauty when we uh, look at some more shots. This is gorgeous as well right here. And then we'll see with some close-ups soon, just the craftsmanship that's involved in these. Yes, it's incredible how much, I mean, because the communities, um, the Beta Karumba, the Pania, the Soligar, um, all of these different communities who are indigenous, 
they know these elephants and each one is an anatomically perfect recreation of a real wild elephant that they know by name and they know their behavior types and so many artists have made elephants uh, that I've worked with over the years but I've never seen anything so lifelike they've even got the movement of the legs you know elephants are actually quite bony and hairy in places so they've even captured that often people their imagination of an elephant affects how they portray them and they end up as these rather large rotund uh, posteriors but yes I think each trunk is doing something different and it, it's probably I think it's quite unique to have something that is so individually crafted um, on such a scale. What's been some of the reaction and feedback you've noticed from the indigenous artisans to uh, the final products and the cause that they know they're supporting? That's such a lovely question. I mean, I, I, I think we, when we started this idea, we couldn't imagine all the different effects it had, it would have. And, and one of them is certainly, you know, we wanted to provide livelihood to indigenous communities who were typically kind of bottom rung in India, often working um, in tea plantations or picking coffee and, and not really uh, respected despite their vast knowledge of nature and their ability to live with endangered animals in harmony and what it's done is um, it's provided employment for over 200 indigenous people and that number is growing um, as, as demand for elephants grow but it's also given them a humongous sense of pride and status the elephants we make sure that they're displayed locally as well as internationally because it's difficult for them to have a concept of Newport or New York it doesn't really resonate uh, they, they sort of very much operate at a forest and local level so um, that's the main thing is that they've found a humongous sense of pride and they've they've been uh, entertained the, the prime minister and the president of India has connected with them come to see the workshops the pre prime president of India has um, herd of elephants outside of her official residence in uh, in New Delhi and Rajtapati Bravan. So th these are consequences we, we couldn't have imagined. Um, the King and Queen of England have also given the artisans an award, the Mark Shand Award ah. uh, last year. So, you know, that that actually means an, I, it finally rewarding the people who live with nature for the, the, the kinds of tolerance they display and the empathy they display towards these animals, they're not always easy to live with. I think that's probably most one of the things that we've ended up loving most about it, as well as our, all the other things. Could you share just a brief word, maybe? What, what are the logistics involved in getting them? <laughs> and maybe from uh, England to... Uh, the Newport in this case, and I know there's several other stops we'll mention uh, after Newport. How involved is that? It's very involved. Actually, the photograph we're looking at now, you might see a man in a light blue t-shirt hovering behind mm. one of the tuskers in the middle. Um, we have a, a wonderful company, IBI Logistics, who do it all for free, actually. And, wow. Um, Yes, we ship them. Well, first of all, we have to go by truck from the Nilgiri Hills, which are quite high up, down to the port in Cochin in India. Then they go into shipping containers. Um, you know, the four really big Tuskers that arrived a couple of weeks late and have only just recently joined the herd couldn't fit in. So they, they went on a different ship. And then, yes, we, we, we just try and keep the carbon footprint as low as possible. So if, where we can, we use electric trucks or solar powered storage units. Oh, aren't they lovely? Look at those eyes. And, um, you know, each elephant has to be staked into the ground. We were doing that until one o'clock in the morning the night before we were due to go live. It's a huge logistical endeavor. Um, and we have a, a wonderful uh, couple, James and Pod, who only got married this year. And it's their first year of married life is migrating this herd of elephants. Wow. So I, we're testing that that early marriage, but so far, <laughs> so far it's um it's you know it's been a joy, and uh, we're we're very blessed by the the people that are doing that. You know these projects they are projects that are, rely on enthusiasm. Uh, so happily we we have it in droves in the team. Wonderful. I know they've only been on display for just. Uh not quite two weeks yet. Um, what's been some of the initial reaction and feedback that you've heard or observed from uh, visitors? I think, uh, you know, I think 
what I love hearing are children repeating, oh, this is coexistence. This is what coexistence is. You know, India, you know, just hearing the story of India being told, if you sit quietly with the herd and you hear people repeat the story of India and it's, it's a, you know, this miracle of uh, a country with a population that's doubled in the last 30 years, but so has the number of elephants and tigers because of this beautiful empathy for wildlife. Um, and I think that's a, a reaction that is probably the most satisfying when you when you hear that the message is getting across and people are taking inspiration from it. Children want to feed them. They're always putting grass in their mouth. Everybody wants to kiss and hug them. There are sometimes over enthusiastic reactions where people want to sit on them, but we, we try and just limit it to hugs and kisses. And, <laughs> uh, you, you know, I think people just really are surprised if they're not expecting to see an entire herd of 50 elephants outside on cliff walk on their regular walk you can imagine you know they really just stop in their tracks some people get quite emotional um as well because they're so lifelike it's a very unusual thing to be able to get a taste of what the kind of sense of you know wonder and awe that you feel when you're in the presence of an entire herd of elephants you know most a lot of people might not have been in an entire herd of elephants and it's it's a quite a close feeling of just the magnitude and the scale um you know you're sort of part of that world when you're with them mm -hmm. well i know i'm looking forward to visiting soon how long will they be in newport and individuals can have the opportunity to visit it around the cliff walk and some of the institutions they will be there until the end of the labor day weekend so it's quite a lovely long stint and I think there's a lot of um, worn out patches of grass. <laughs> it's like people are saying it's like Glastonbury, but I think in, in American terms, that would be like Coachella. There's quite a lot of people <laughs> making little pathways around the elephants. So I think they'll be very, um, they'll be very missed. They'll just be these lovely lumps of grass when they go. But yes, we have until the end of the Labor Day weekend. They leave on the 3rd of September. And I know most people will just go on their own and uh, tour, but I think there are also potential tours uh, available or other programming you might have over the course of the next few months. That's right. Uh, we have drinks with the elephants that everyone's invited to at Salve Regina at Macaulay Hall on the 8th of August. Um, with a little lovely stripy tent uh, and lots of lovely drinks. And then on the 12th of August, it's World Elephant Day. So there will be a talk. And then, yes, then, then they start migrating. They start getting ready for their next leg of the journey. They go live in Manhattan in the Meatpacking District on the 6th of September for Fashion Week. Um, and then from there, they move on for winter. They're going to winter in Miami in warmer climes before they start their long journey across the country. Wonderful, wonderful. Well. Definitely encourage viewers and others to make their way down to Newport in the next couple of months. An additional feature related to the great elephant migration, and this one curated uh, by Dodi Kazanjian here with you, um, is some artwork with contemporary artists. Yes, there there is an incredible Persian artist, Hadi Palapishi, who has created multiple shows. Uh, there he is, uh, quite a genius of a human being. And he's responding to the theme of migration in his work. He himself uh, migrated to America and had that sense of insecurity, some you know mixed emotions, and that's all evoked in his work. There is the most incredible show at, um, which I should have mentioned at the Great Friends Meeting House, where there's also a Tusker, a lone rogue Tusker outside. Um, he has an incredible show there. This photograph is of his smallest show, which is at Rough Point uh, in the um, the glass house or the orangery, I think. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm using the right uh, term for that, that, that lovely sunroom. I think it's called the sunroom. And um, I think uh, the, the, the finale will be at the breakers um, towards the end of August. And, you know, he's really taken everything to a whole other standard. I know he's in the permanent collection of the Whitney Museum, very, mm -hmm. very playful um, and showing, you know, evoking a lot of elephants in his work as well. The exhibition, I think, is called The Searchers. Mm -hmm. Oh, so much fun. So much fun.
there's, there's a lot of little elephants standing on human feet um, in the one in the great friends meeting house. And when I got there, my feet were about ready to um, protest against me after carrying so many elephants with the team to install. So I think he just hit the nail on the head with that one. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Oh, Wonderful. glorious. Such joyful work. You know, in addition to visiting other other ways, perhaps volunteering that individuals can become involved with the project. Yes, we really need and um, appreciate all offers of voluntary help. When, um, especially at the the biggest concentration of elephants at Salve Regina on the main lawn at, on Cliff Walk. Uh, and I think on our website, thegreatelephantmigration.org, there is a support section where you can get in touch with us if you're interested or willing to lend some hours of your time to help answer questions and keep the elephants safe. There are so many questions that people ask. We would, of course, train you up. <laughs> Terrific. You know, I'm sure this is dominating uh, your time for sure right now. But are there other projects or what are some other endeavors that you're involved with with these issues? So the other the other main project at the moment is um, with a, an organization called Pangea Trust, which is a European organization based in Portugal, where we are trying to rescue all of the elephants that are in circuses and um, give them a sanctuary uh, in, in a wilderness area. And uh, that, that's quite a big endeavor. There's, there's hundreds of elephants that, you know, all the laws have changed. Elephants are no longer meant to be in circuses, but there is no sanctuary actually in Europe. Unlike in America, you have the Tennessee sanctuary and various others. So that's another big effort that I'm involved in. And then Platform Earth, we make art out of carbon negative or carbon sequestering materials, which is um, another fun endeavor. We just did a show in London actually. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, look forward to finding out more of those organizations as well. But Ruth, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for being here, for informing us about the Great Elephant Migration related organizations. And again, congratulations to you and everyone involved with this fabulous effort and wonderful opportunity for those of us in the local area to appreciate both the setting, but also the bigger cause of the coexistence uh, humans and animal wildlife um, in Asia. Today. Thank you for your warmth and your curiosity and your generosity in sharing your spotlight with this project. Wonderful. I also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.